And notice how I said without your boss seeing your practice. Because that, when you talk about culture, we're talking about psychological safety. Hi, I'm Matt, your host of the CX and Culture Connection, the podcast for CX leaders looking to accelerate value from addressing CX and culture together. I'm excited to be here today with Stacey Sherman, who's a speaker, author, and host of Doing CX Right podcast. I love your podcast, Stacey. Welcome. Great to be with you. Thank you so much. Glad to be on the other side of the uh, microphone here as the guest. Wonderful. Stacy, to kick us off, um, in your Doing CX White podcast, you talk about humanizing business and delivering deeper meaning. What does it mean to humanize business? Hmm. What it means is really getting to the heart of business, which we know typically companies put profit first. And of course, business is meant for revenue. However, while generating revenue, there's no reason to create bad experiences for your customers. Now, customers are internal and external, and one drives the other. So I've experienced in the workplace way too much of how there's a lack of human heart, and there's an opportunity to change that. I love the connection to emotion and purpose and people um, finding meaning in their relationships with each other and with their company and with the customers they work with. Seth Godin talks about experience as a gift. And I love that. And and I, I see a lot of that in your work about how do you make experience a gift that you give? Absolutely. Uh, ironically, you said his name. He uh, was on my show yesterday. It's on. Uh, well, I can't, yeah, can't wait so to see it. Yeah. So anyway, but yes, to his point and your point, for sure, it is a gift. Feedback is a gift. We know that too. So when you talk about uh, the human experience, you also emphasize then a lot the employee experience. And you talked about customers can be internal too. How does the employee experience deliver that heartfelt customer experience? Well, let's take an example. All right. Customer service agents in contact centers. We depend on them as customers because they're the ones that we're calling when we have a problem or chatting online with uh, or maybe transferred after a robot put us in circles to finally get to. Now, think about it. If they are not empowered to deliver a great customer experience, if they are not valued, one, they'll leave. High attrition rate is a problem. And secondly, they show up and deliver that experience and pay it forward or not to the customer. So it's so important that they have a sense of community, that they have the empowerment to take care of the customer and make it right and get it right the first time. So there's such a huge link between the internal and the external. And now that's an example of a customer service agent, but it applies to all workforce teams. I agree. A lot of the uh, emphasis in customer listening and modernizing it with uh, AI and unstructured data is emphasized call centers because there's a lot of data there and there's a lot of experiences that you can improve. But to your point, the frontline experience, um, there's enormous uh, opportunity to improve all frontline experience. This is the, the EXCX intersection is, is touches many employees in the company, not just the call centers. Absolutely. And I also want to highlight that, yes, your frontline are essential. And it's interesting when I talk to salespeople and contact center agents, Salespeople actually say, huh, I never thought of the contact center agents as the front line. And I'm, th I'm like, yeah, sometimes they are the first one in line. So that role is so essential. And obviously the working together is key. You know, a lot of times people don't make this connection that the brand promise of a company 
is delivered by its people. A lot of times people think about the marketing campaign or they think about the website experience or the experience using the product. You know, P&G used to say the first moment of truth is when she picks it up in the shelf and the second moment of truth is when she uses the product. Well, there are lots of other moments of truth when you're interacting with people and they actually deliver your brand promise in many ways more than a lot of these other experiences because you create an emotional connection with the people at companies, especially in B2B companies. Yes. The challenge and the opportunity is that every company over 25 years I've been working in corporate, different industries, silos exist. And the problem is that there's this domino effect where people don't realize how their job impacts the next part of the customer journey. And so that's a huge issue of breaking those silos, improving communication, because it has absolutely a huge impact on what customers perceive and feel with the brand. What you're highlighting really resonates with me. It's that there's just not just the mindsets and the attitudes of the people, but their behaviors. Um, you know, it's important, happy customers, happy employees equals happy customers. And the, the attitudes and mindsets of the employees are important, how they show up, but the way they behave with the customers, but as you're highlighting the way people behave with each other inside of a company is really important too. The, the, the collaboration, the sharing information, the way they support each other, the way they create space to share ideas. These are all behaviors that create good customer experience. Yeah, interesting enough, it's Mental Health Awareness Month right now. And on LinkedIn today, I actually posted the point that we need to bring psychology and customer experience, which has the EX to it. We need to blend it. And there's an article I co-wrote with a doctor, uh, Grant Brenner, who talks about ambient gaslighting how there's this invisible thread that's causing employees and staff to have burnout. There's this psychological <laughs> ambient gaslighting that's going on that's causing the attrition. And then this other article that's combined in Psychology Today we did is the fact that we also have to own our customer experience. We need to own our employee experience. We can't always just wait for others to create it for us. So there's a lot to say about how others give us the experience, but also the mental impact, how we show up. That's really fascinating that you make this connection, um, not just to consumer behavior, but, you know, a lot of people who focus on psychology and CX think about the consumer behavior side, the brain science, the psychology of consumer behavior. But it's equally important how this impacts within the company as well, um, both in terms of the employee engagement and then how that impacts the customer engagement. How did you get interested in the psychology aspect of this and, and, and how have you pursued that? So my angle to it, I studied marketing uh, and I have a master's degree in marketing, but a piece of it was understanding consumer mental models and, and human behavior. And I love psychology. Now I'm not a doctorate. I don't have, you know, those advanced letters. Uh, however, as I mentioned that Dr. Brenner, who's a family member, we've been melding this together. And especially because burnout's so big, and I believe there's an opportunity that he and I've been doing is to really bring that awareness of how the psychology impacts CX. And, and most of the world's kind of keeping them separate, but we're bringing it together because there's such synergy. And you think about it, how, how one feels when they show up, whether it's in the workplace or virtual. I remember uh, when I was working with uh, people who service customers on the phone and they didn't see, there was no video, but yet we still had the staff dress up and smile. And some of them are like, why? 
No one's looking at me. And I said, because it affects how you show up. They can hear your smile. That's really fascinating. Your, your body language affects others, but it also affects you yourself. If you smile, you're actually happier. Yes. And therefore, the customer, the your boss, your colleague, they feel it. And so there's this invisible thread that is so clear. It has such an impact. And it doesn't require millions of dollars of investment in a high technology solution. Well, you, you know, Peter Drucker is famous for saying culture eats strategy for breakfast. But he actually didn't say that. He said something similar to it. We just use that quote because it's easier to remember. And I actually discovered that um, researching my book, The CX and Culture Connection. I've been using that quote for years and then realized he didn't actually say that. He said something similar to it. But the meaning, I think, is very powerful, which is, you know, strategy is important, but culture it, uh, affects everything. And if you don't pay attention to people, and to the humanizing aspect of it, like you said, in behavior, the strategy won't work. Um, and the psychology is so important to, to consider, like, because we're human beings and we need to think about what actually drives behavior, what drives collaboration, what drives effective decision making in an organization. And without paying attention to culture, change management won't work. Now, you said something important here, which I think it's worth mentioning. We are humans living in the AI era. And we know that AI is being used to free up time, which is a good thing. And to do analysis of, gosh, in all the jobs I've had, reading thousands and thousands of surveys. Now, clearly the AI can scrub all that information, prioritize those actions really quickly and go act on them, close the loop, all that. There are times that the AI cannot solve and should not solve that customer pain point. And so knowing the difference is part of humanizing business. Okay. So it's, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion now with AI around, you know, ethical AI and what's the best way to optimize things. I think a lot of companies are trying to strike a balance, you know, where they have human beings involved in reviewing content before it gets approved or changing it a little bit further before, based on what the AI did or reviewing what the AI summarizes and then acting on it. But you know, you don't really take the human being out of it, out of it so much as create a more agile, iterative approach for the human being able to work faster and put more time into, you know, maybe you'll create a hundred versions of content in a third of the time, but you still have human beings involved. Yeah, absolutely. And let me, <laughs> I say this strongly with emphasis that if you don't do that, when I see a social media post or if I get an email communication from a company and I see the words delve and the strong AI terms that are used repetitively, I literally delete, unsubscribe. So you could actually turn the AI into a negative experience and lose customers and prospects just from simple words. I caution people to definitely proofread if you're using AI, change it, include your personality, include your brand voice, because it's, it's a problem. People are deleting. So, you know, you, you have a framework called heart and science. And I can see in a lot of your answers, the balancing of the two being blended. Do you want to elaborate a little bit about your framework, Art and Science, for, for the audience? Yes. So we don't have enough time to go into what each of these mean. But at a high level, purpose is helping people bring the heart to business, bringing the better communications, bringing the empathy, bringing the soft skills. And how do you actually do that to make a better impact and drive loyalty? And on the other side, you've got the science side, the data, the metrics, the non-fluffy stuff. And together, that's really how 
what I call, you can really double your income from existing customers and drive loyalty and get referrals. So many times people are so much focused on acquiring new and new, and it's kind of sexy to get a big sale, but then they forget the value and the amplification of your current customers. And so that's really what I'm talking about. What's the role of emotion then, you know, in uh, great EX and CX? How do you think about the role of emotion? Well, we are human beings with a heart and, a, and feelings, though I know we often as human beings turn off our feelings. But in the end, people buy based on emotions. I don't buy a certain, I don't know, cup of coffee because I like spending triple the amount. I buy because I like the experience when I walk into certain coffee shops. I like the smell. I like the friendliness. Hi, Stacy. Welcome back. Oh, we made a mistake. We'll do it over. No worries. No questions asked. I mean, we're buying an experience and it touched upon our emotion. It touched upon our heart. There's a connection. And so if you think that that's not important, then boy, we need to talk. <laughs> well, what you're highlighting is that a lot of the emotional attachment we have with the brand comes from things that are beyond the functional benefits of using the product or service. And so our interactions with other human beings, our interaction with the environment, when you walk into that coffee shop you just mentioned and you hear the music or smell the ground coffee or interact with other people that you're there in the third space. You know, um, I just had uh, Joseph Michelli on who wrote Leading the Starbucks Way on the podcast. And he talks a lot about how Starbucks creates a brand that goes well beyond the product experience and creates a much deeper emotional attachment. And, and he emphasizes the employee side of this. Starbucks does this by creating a great employee connection with the coffee experience and with being, and with the customer experience that, um, you know, I think you're, you're both in that same space, which is how do you get beyond the product? How do you deliver a deeper, deeper emotional attachment and how do you translate great EX into great CX? Agree. And he's a shared common friend. And I agree absolutely that there is that common thread. And that is why we really have to think of a customer from internal and external. And the other thing I want to say, as I've been doing a lot in content creation and podcasting, and I'm hosting podcast events lately, what's interesting is people don't think about the definition of customer in a broad sense. Customers are your sponsors, your vendors, your partners, your guest experience. When I'm speaking on stage, the audience is my customer and keeping them engaged and, and fulfilled. So I want people to realize, even your listeners on your show right now, that customer is not narrow. It is something that we all are and that all we get to do regardless of job title. We always can have an impact with our interactions with other people. And that's what makes it worth getting up in the morning and doing something with, with, a, with a, a goal, with the mission, because you want to give to others and you want to get fulfillment from those experiences. Yes. And to what we said earlier, I feel really, really passionate about the fact that we also have to own our experience. When I call the 800 number frustrated about a product not getting delivered, that agent on the phone I have two choices. I can yell at the person, take out my aggression and my worries of the day on that person who's just the messenger, right? <laughs> he or she is just doing their job and hopefully has empathy and hopefully uses their brain versus just reading from a script. However, the other is I could come at this with hey, I have a problem. I'm so glad you answered the phone. I'm so glad to have a human being here. Can you help me? And that dialogue is going to go differently. 
So we have to own our experience too. And you have a lot of experience with um, call centers and with training and with frontline employees, both call centers and, and understanding how to help people engage more effectively in those experiences, both build the skills, build the training, drive the right behaviors. How do you, how do you think about linking, like picking the right behaviors to train on and getting people to build those as habits? I'm actually reading for the second time Atomic Habits. Such a good book. I don't know if you've read it, but it's so applicable to creating better habits and, oh, how do I even narrow this down? I think that it really has a huge impact to leadership. As leaders, in many times in companies, they offer training. They do onboarding really well, and then they're done. They, they're they like, you know, never come back to that employee or staff member or intern or contractor and meet with them again and really ask, how's it going and where do you need help? And it's kind of like a one and done, check the box. And so really to create better habits, there's that consistency and reinforcement. And so that's why I say it starts with leadership. And a lot of times leaders are thrown into a job and they've never been a leader before. So there's, there's this amplification effect and there's this consistency is the word where you are training people on the soft skills, you're training them on the tools, and the technology, and you're asking them for feedback, how easy or difficult is it to do your job? And so all of that really is where you build the skills, not just to do your job really well, but to actually service the customer who's paying your bill and your, and your income. I think the leadership angle is really important. Um, I, um, I wrote an article a, a number of years ago uh, for Strategy and Business. Um, it was the cover feature for the issue, and it was about leadership experience. And I, I collaborated with Art Kleiner, who was the editor at the time, um, and I um, always enjoyed collaborating with him on writing things. And, and the, uh, the article was about how leadership experience can be an enabler of great customer or great employee experience, that the way your leaders mentalize, the way they, they engage, the way they think about self-reflective about themselves and are intentional about the types of behaviors they want to engage in, it allows them to be more effective at either customer employee experience because of the way they show up as leaders. And so we, we actually applied um, brain science, like higher versus lower ground system one versus system two thinking to how do you actually um, cultivate leadership? And I think this, I'm, I'm a perpetual student like you reading or rereading things. And I, I think this topic around leadership and behavior and culture, that's why I'm so passionate about it, is an enabler of great CX and EX. And, and that's what I'm dedicated to myself as to how to reinforce that connection with culture. I'd love to add that sometimes the best learning opportunities are from great bosses and really bad ones. And I had one that I remember I came to this person with all the, all the things I did to remove obstacles. I didn't come to the boss to complain. I said, I did A, B, C, D and and challenge, but because of your connections in the organization and your title, if you can make this one phone call, we can remove the roadblocks and move forward, which benefits the whole team. And this person's answer to me when I asked for help was, no, go figure it out. Now, I tell you this story because I never forgot that story. I now figure everything out. So thank you for that bad experience, I think. <laughs> uh, 
I have never led that way, so I knew how to lead better. And I just want to point out that we learn from both the good experiences and the ones that we don't appreciate at all at the time. But reflecting back, I do. I figure everything out now because of that person. I'm going to bring it back um, a little bit to some of what we were talking about before about listening and about, um, you know, even AI is, you know, one of the things I'm fascinated with now is you can identify the behaviors you want, but now we can actually listen for whether the behaviors are showing up in the experience. It's a new frontier for customer and employee listening is if you want a certain set of behaviors to occur in the organization, are they actually showing up in the customer experience? Like if you want your person on the call center to be focused on courtesy, or you want them to be focused on uh, having a solution that focuses on the needs of the customer versus just pushing expensive product, you can actually see whether the behaviors on the call are consistent with that without having someone have to review every call. AI can actually do that for you and then have human beings see, hey, these calls could use some coaching go spend some time coaching this person on this behavior. AI can actually help you build that feedback loop now. Yes. One of the aspects of AI that I think is a great use case is when you have people coming into the job and they're, they're customer facing, you actually can use the AI as a simulation. So you can practice with the AI and there's some vendors that uh, I really like who offer this solution. And so I could, if I was a service agent or I was a salesperson, I could practice with the AI. The AI will actually grade me and I can practice as many times as I want without my boss even seeing it until I'm ready for that to be seen. And I think that's very powerful because that's very scary you, you need confidence before you take your first call, what they call nesting stage. So AI is really powerful that. And if, if people want to know more, I'm happy to discuss because it's it's a powerful tool and there's some really good players out there. And I think that's wonderful that not only are you providing training and coaching, but you're able and inspiration to people but able to help them um, take advantage of some of the innovations of AI and experiment and do new things with it. And notice how I said without your boss seeing your practice, because that, when you talk about culture, we're talking about psychological safety, mm -hmm. right? So that's part of the culture. Absolutely. Um, I think uh, companies that don't foster collaboration, that don't create that safety, that don't encourage sharing information. They're not very effective at driving decision-making. They, they, it end up, ends up reinforcing silos. People don't take risks. They don't, um, you know, bring their full self to work and you end up with a lot less, um, less done. You mentioned uh, to me earlier that you have a book coming out. I'd love to learn more about what that is and, and uh, you know, uh, get our audience a sneak peek at what's coming. Oh, thank you for that. So I have two things cooking right now. So one is a book and it's all about customer, I shouldn't say customer, it's journey management. Now, the reason I don't say just customers because there is the customer and the employee but it's really that omni-channel journey management. And you think about how someone learns, buy, get, use, pay, get help. It is really that holistic journey. And so it's a prescriptive book on how do you do that right. So that book is coming. Uh, it's in uh, working with a publisher now and still in the writing phase. And then I have a second LinkedIn course that is the first one launched in February, um, focused on driving customer loyalty by doing the agent experience right, which is includes all workforce. But the second course is really about communication and doing communication right across that journey. So you can see the link of these are things that are all in our control. Well, 
um, if people wanted to learn more, they can go to Doing CX Right to learn more about you for speaking or your courses or your book in the future and certainly your podcast episodes. What's the best uh, way for people to get in touch with you, Stacey? And, and, and what are some of the things that uh, they could do to follow up with you um, that, that, that you would encourage them to explore with you? Thank you for that. So yes, as you said, doingcxright.com is tons of free resources and a way to get in touch with me for speaking, workshops, content partnership, and consulting and advising. So a lot of opportunities. And then I'm very invested in LinkedIn. I post every day actionable tips not about what I ate for dinner last night. I am on Facebook, but that's really, uh, <laughs> LinkedIn is my favorite. Uh, and and sharing and, and encouraging that dialogue and peer-to-peer -peer education. But I'm on all channels, Twitter, threads, Instagram, uh, doing cxright.com. Well, it's been a, a really fun conversation. Um, I, I definitely... Um, know you spark some ideas for me and I'm sure have for the audience as well. Uh, and I'm really uh, looking forward to um, seeing your book when it comes out and to continuing the conversation in the future. Thank you so much. Appreciate being here. <laughs> <laughs>